Christ! We're not hunting him. He's hunting us. Hold it. Friend or enemy? I'm a friend. You're a liar. Hey everybody, so recently I watched one of the most entertaining, but also one of the stupidest, action films that I have ever seen, in which it seemed the entertainment value was directly proportional to the relative stupidity of the scene that was playing. By this point, I've realized it's a lot more fun to review bad movies than to review good movies. Deadly Prey is a 1987 action film produced by Action International Pictures, directed by David Pryor and starring David Pryor's brother, Ted Pryor. The film is essentially a loose retelling of the most dangerous game, although it was likely created to ride off the success of 80s action films like Commando and First Blood, which can be seen fairly clearly from the cover alone. So what's this film about? Well, before we start, there is one thing I should point out. After looking at some recent feedback, I have decided to do this review in a different style, as well as to try integrating the film's summary and my review, so I'll be making my points about the movie during my overview of it. Let me know what you guys think, and without further ado, let's get right into it. Please keep in mind, this is just my opinion. Deadly Prey starts off with an unnaturally long montage of people loading various guns interspersed with credits. After this is done, a large group of soldiers is seen chasing a man through the woods with the aforementioned guns. The scene lasts for a long time, after which the running guy gets captured by one of the soldiers. Somehow, the exhausted man with a rock manages to incapacitate the trained soldier with a gun, and he just books it out of there without taking the gun. You'd think he'd want to defend himself, but I guess that wasn't on his mind. Finally, the running guy trips in a clearing, and he's approached by the soldiers and their leader, who you know is a bad guy because he wears black sunglasses and never takes them off. The running guy screams unconvincingly, and Sunglasses Guy shoots him. Now, I think this guy is supposed to be intimidating, but his clothes are weird, his hair is weird, his voice totally doesn't match his character. Not good. The runner took out one of our men. And when he's walking, he holds his rifle like an idiot, so he just comes off as being kind of goofy. Anyway, Sunglasses Guy goes over to the soldier who is defeated by a rock, and of course, says a one-liner and shoots him because he failed. I mean, I don't blame him for being disappointed in this guy because it was kind of pathetic, but I think shooting him takes it a step too far. However, with these two scenes finished, I present my first point. Really long scenes. Something I noticed throughout the film are that some scenes are a lot longer than they need to be. Case in point, the first two scenes of the entire movie. The combined gun loading and chase scenes take up an entire seven minutes, when they probably could have been compressed into half that length. Scenes are never drawn out so long that they become unbearable, but they do feel a bit stretched. Anyway, back to the film. We transition to an unidentified military base of some sort where we meet our main villain, Colonel Hogan, who wears a nondescript military jacket and keeps several grenades on his desk at all times. Hogan is recruiting some guys to be part of his military organization, which is never actually identified in the movie. I mean, they have tanks and personnel carriers and military-grade equipment, but Hogan says they're some kind of mercenary group, but they're funded by this random businessman who's in the movie for three minutes, and it's all just confusing. Hogan tells Sunglasses Guy that their war games, in which they chase an unarmed person through the jungle, are not working well enough, and they need a new runner. Sunglasses Guy agrees, and then the film immediately transitions to him and another soldier driving around suburban Los Angeles. No shots of them preparing, or planning, or doing anything, just one minute we're in the base, next minute we're in a van. This is point number two, abrupt cuts. And this movie is absolutely full of them. They range from being mildly awkward to just flat out confusing, like we're running around in the jungle and then we're just instantly in a house that we've never been to before. It's distracting to say the least. Anyway, we cut to the introduction of our hero, whose name I didn't actually have to look up because they repeatedly mention it throughout the movie. 
Mike Danton wakes up in his house with his wife and goes to take out the trash, at which point he's knocked out by sunglasses guy and kidnapped to be used as a runner. Okay, now this isn't really a point, just a stupid thing that could have easily been fixed. Now, we later learn that Mike is this super skilled, dangerous Vietnam veteran, so it would make sense for them to have specifically gotten him for a challenge, right? No, nope, they just randomly picked him up off the street and he just happened to be the most dangerous person they could have possibly picked. It makes no sense, but that's honestly what I've come to expect from this movie. Back in the military base, the aforementioned businessman talks with Hogan about how he's unhappy about how slowly the soldiers are training. They argue for a while, and the businessman gives Hogan one month to train them. We see Mike at the base where he is ordered by Sunglasses Guy to run. Mike says, You're gonna die. And then runs away. With that, the action has begun, and so has point number three, getting to the action. Now, this one is actually a positive. I really like that this movie just gets straight into the action without messing around for too long. Too many of these action B-movies spend forever on boring, inconsequential things while you're just waiting for the action. Deadly Prey suffers from no such issue. You can tell that they at least had a solid idea of the action they wanted, and they don't screw around in getting to it. So, in the forest, Mike is sneaking around avoiding the soldiers, but he needs a weapon. How does he take out the first soldier? Does he set a trap or attack him with stealth? No, he just whacks him with a massive stick and knocks him out before jacking his M16 and his knife. Although in the next scene he doesn't have the M16 anymore, so I guess he forgot about it. For the next minute, Mike takes out soldiers using moves that are supposed to be sneaky, but are actually just loud and obvious. Ooh. 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 Then he holds the last soldier with his knife and interrogates him for information that we already know. I think for this scene, Mike was supposed to hold his hand over the guy's mouth and keep him quiet, but his timing was so off that he just ended up cutting the guy off mid-sentence. Hogan! Kill Hogan! Mike kills him, and we cut back to the base, where Hogan has Sunglasses Guy kill one of the other soldiers for no reason. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mike's wife, who up until this point has done nothing, calls her ex-policeman father for help instead of calling the actual police. In the forest, Mike kills more soldiers in stupid ways, including a spear throw reminiscent of Conan the Destroyer. Up until this point, he's been killing them solely with his knife, but I guess he got bored because he makes a spear, kills one guy, and then books it. Back at Mike's house, his wife's father, played by the ubiquitous Cameron Mitchell, talks with her about identifying the van that took Mike. He promises to try tracking it down. Hogan is in his tent making out with his girlfriend for some reason, but when he hears about how Mike is killing everyone, he gathers his troops and heads out. They find dead bodies in the woods, but are unable to locate Mike, even though he was crouching on a branch that was literally five feet above their heads. Hogan apparently recognizes Mike's style of killing and mentions that he trained Mike in Vietnam. Meanwhile, Mike fights two soldiers and gets smacked around a lot. Speaking of which, here is point number four, hand-to-hand -hand combat. The hand-to-hand -hand combat in this movie is just bad. Kind of funny at times, but mostly bad, which is probably why so many people get stabbed. However, what it really is is inconsistent, especially when it comes to how easy it is to knock someone out. For instance, when Mike is kidnapped, he is knocked down instantly with a single hit. However, during the fight in the woods, I actually went through and counted and he takes no less than nine full force punches to the face and he is completely fine afterwards. <laughs> It's just dumb, but it's par for the course with these kinds of movies. Soon after, Mike performs what I like to call the water maneuver and the leaf maneuver, in which he hides under water or leaves, waits for one of the soldiers to come by, makes a stupid noise, and then kills them. The leaf maneuver is the best in my opinion because the noise he makes is actually kind of funny. <laughs> One of the soldiers says, Christ! We're not hunting him! He's hunting us! And then Sunglasses Guy says, Suck this. Suck this! Which doesn't make any sense because it has nothing to do with what they were talking about, but it doesn't matter because he kills the guy anyway. Mike gets ambushed by a guy with a knife who he somehow kills with a little twig that he found on the ground. The soldiers call off the chase for the night, and Mike forages for food, during which he eats what I honestly think is an actual worm. I mean, if that's not method acting, I don't know what is. 
The soldiers make camp and Hogan gives us exposition about how he trained Mike in Vietnam. Then Mike sneaks up behind Hogan with a knife, but doesn't kill him even though he's been killing everyone else. Mike goes back to his campsite and falls asleep. In the morning, he's woken up by two redneck stereotypes who threaten to shoot him if he doesn't leave. Now why don't you get up and go before I get a mind to fill your behind full of bird shot. Go on, get! Hogan and his group find the rednecks and make them say where Mike went before shooting them. This is as good a time as any to bring out point number five, character development. There isn't any. In fact, there are no characters in this movie, only exaggerated caricatures of different archetypes. You got the stoic trained killer, the insane military official, the incompetent damsel in distress, the stone-faced police officer, and a whole menagerie of flat, static characters. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger as John Matrix in Commando has some kind of character arc. Mike Danton has like eight lines of dialogue and a knife. The only character with some semblance of individuality is Mike's friend, who joined the mercenary group but decided to help Mike fight them off. However, I will say this for the film. These kinds of characters are probably the only ones that would actually fit in the context of the movie. Flat characters work with a flat plot. Anyway, the soldiers chase Mike up a hill, but he rolls some styrofoam rocks down at them which proves to be quite effective. However, it turns out this was completely useless because Sunglasses Guy found another way up the hill and he starts to brawl with Mike using way too many kicks. Now you'd think this is where Mike defeats Sunglasses Guy so he can defeat Hogan in the final confrontation, but nope, he gets totally thrashed and he's brought back to the base alive. Hogan tries to recruit Mike to train his soldiers, but Mike hates him so it doesn't work. While Mike is tied up to a chair in the tent, we abruptly cut to Cameron Mitchell, who I forgot was in the movie, getting out of a car with a shotgun and heading off towards the base. At the base, Sunglasses Guy beats the crap out of Mike to try to coerce him, I think? Cameron Mitchell sneaks into the base and sees the businessman from earlier, who he ends up following. In the tent, Mike breaks out of his chair because there was no one guarding him and knocks out Hogan's girlfriend. Mike flees the tent, but he's stopped by a huge guy who he defeats by literally shoving a live grenade down his pants and blowing him up. They even do that cartoon thing where the guy's boots are still there, which was actually kind of funny because it totally caught me off guard. Mike is shot at by a tank, but manages to throw a grenade into the hatch and blow up the driver. With this, we arrive at point number six, explosives. Now, this probably seems really specific, but I felt it was worth mentioning how useless explosives are in this movie. Several times, Mike is within five feet of a grenade blast and he's completely fine because the grenades are filled with flash powder and all they do is make a little poof of smoke. I mean, in this scene, a literal tank shell hits the ground two feet away from Mike and all that happens is he trips. The only time in which explosives actually do something is if Mike is the one using them. Anyway, after blowing up the tank, Mike is attacked by a helicopter, at which point he fires a grenade and completely blows it up. This part is actually kind of cool in a stupid way. He runs into the forest and gets hit by three more grenades, which he doesn't die from, although he does fall down several times. Contrarily, he manages to kill three more guys using just grenades. Mike eventually shoots everybody and escapes with the help of his friend that he met earlier. Mike's friend tells the group that Mike ran away, but I think Sunglasses Guy suspects him. On the road outside the base, Cameron Mitchell ambushes the businessman, and he monologues about injustice for a while before shooting the businessman and going back to the base, even though he literally just left. Hogan orders Mike's wife to be kidnapped, and then he sexually assaults her. Cameron Mitchell sneaks around the base for a while before encountering a soldier. Here we get what I think is the single best one-liner in the entire film. Friend or enemy? I'm a friend. You're a liar. However, Cameron is soon captured and brought to Hogan, and once he finds out what happened with his daughter, he starts strangling Hogan, which the other guards don't really seem to have much of a problem with. I mean, they're not even trying here. It doesn't matter though, because Hogan shoots Cameron anyway. We abruptly cut to Mike's house, where he finds out that his wife has just been kidnapped. Hogan's girlfriend is there, and Mike talks on the phone to Hogan, who tries to make a bargain for Mike's wife. Mike is still really pissed off, so he says, Fuck you. And then punches Hogan's girlfriend so hard that she dies. 
Mike gets equipped with a large variety of weapons that he keeps in his house for some reason. This is where the movie briefly transitions from first blood ripoff to commando ripoff as Mike gets an obscene amount of weapons, including a rocket launcher, puts on some useless camouflage paint and sets a bunch of overly complex traps in the woods. Mike and his friends sneak back to the base where they stab some more guys and rescue Mike's wife. Then they try to blow up the tent, but it's one of those flash powder grenades so it doesn't really do much. For the next seven minutes, a decent amount of soldiers are killed through a combination of traps and being shot. Of course, they shoot back, but their aim is so bad that it doesn't really matter. Mike gets a rocket launcher, so he goes again and blows up more guys. Sunglasses Guy manages to capture Mike's wife, who is hiding, and he brings her to Hogan. Mike's friend shoots Hogan and saves Mike's wife, but then Sunglasses Guy shoots him and he dies. Mike sees this and chases after Sunglasses Guy, who just ends up shooting Mike's wife anyway. Now, I think this scene is supposed to be dramatically shot, but the edits are so abrupt and the line deliveries are so bad that the scene just ends up being awkward and kind of funny. Bitch. No! Now that his wife and friend have been killed, Mike is so monumentally pissed off that he throws away his gun, takes out a machete, cuts off Sunglasses Guy's arm, and then beats him to death with his own severed arm before scalping him. Mike finds Hogan, who was wounded by Mike's friend, but instead of killing him, he just tells Hogan to start running, implying he'll hunt Hogan down like he was hunted. Then he screams for a while and the movie is over. The end. Now, if that seemed kind of sudden and anticlimactic to you, you're not alone. Which brings us to the first of our final three points. Point number seven, the ending. Now, I see what they were going for. This was supposed to be the melancholy ending, where the tragic hero has lost everything despite fighting for it. There's just one problem. That just doesn't work in these kind of movies. You can't give us mindless, over-the-top fantasy action and then all of a sudden become serious. Not to say that tragic endings can't work, they just have to be well executed, and this ending is anything but. Not to mention the fact that all this stuff happens within the last five minutes of a 90 minute movie, so it just kinda comes out of nowhere and totally blindsides you. Also, they made a sequel in 2013 and it turns out Hogan didn't even die, which makes it even worse. Point number eight, action versus non-action. In Deadly Prey, there is a clear separation between action scenes and everything else. This could just be because of the abrupt editing and bizarre pacing, but my personal theory is that the action was written before anything else, so any non-action scene was just kind of slapped on at the end. Finally, number nine, enjoyment. Now, you may be sitting here listening to me bash this film and thinking that I had a horrible time watching it. This is absolutely not the case. In fact, I had a phenomenal time watching this movie. It manages to hit the perfect level of bad that allows it to become incredibly entertaining again. Any better or any worse, and it would have been a lot less entertaining. However, it's still a very badly made movie, which prompted me to devise the KRB Bad Movie Rating System, or the KRBBMR system. Admittedly, it doesn't roll off the tongue very well, but that's besides the point. On the KRBBMR system, movies are rated based on quality, how well made and executed a film is, and entertainment factor, which is how enjoyable the film is, regardless of quality. On this scale, I give Deadly Prey a 3 out of 10 for quality, and an 8 out of 10 for entertainment, with a combined score of 5.5 out of 10. A horrible movie that's a lot of fun to watch. Also, Cameron Mitchell is billed higher in the credits than Ted Pryor, who is literally the main character of the film.